Well, hello, Earthlings. Greetings, hello. You all look really excited to be here. Pre I appreciate that. I appreciate the fist pump in the back. I'm sorry if you've never experienced what I do at talks, but it's not like the thing where someone's really boring. So if you're looking for that, you should just save yourself trouble and leave now. Ron likes jokes. <laughs> it's just what happens. Anyway, I'm Ron Bronson. This is Charles Brandt. Hi. Um, we're here from the Bloomington, Indiana, uh, the city of Bloomington. Charles still works there. I don't. We'll get into that later, though. Um, not really. Uh, we didn't fight. It was totally amicable. But at any rate, um, we uh, launched our website a couple months ago, moved it from um, an in-house CMS to Drupal. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about that. And hopefully after you have a million questions for us about what you're working on and how we can help you save yourself some time and trouble or about what we did or whatever. Sound great? All right, I'll take that as enthusiasm. Uh, yes. Charles, tell them about yourself, Charles. Um, so I'm from the city of Bloomington in Indiana. I always like to specify because there are many cities of Bloomington um, across the country, but we happen to be the one in Indiana. Um, that's the home of Indiana University. So we are a pretty small uh, college town. So. I think um, when students are there, we're about 80,000. When the students leave in the summer, we go down to about 40,000. So not a real big city, but um, we are fortunate in that we have um, a small team of uh, developers in-house that let us take on projects like migrating our city's website to Drupal. So um, we have a number of open source projects that we um, make available on our city's GitHub page. And um, we are always eager to share, um, share what we've learned and what we've done with other cities. So um, absolutely reach out to us and let us know. Charles, what did you do before you got to City of Bloomington? <laughs> this is about you. <laughs> they want to know about you. Um, I've been a developer for quite some time. Um, working with Python and PHP and JavaScript, um, and I've just been uh, very happy to be working at uh, my municipal government um, developing open source software. So, cool. What about you, Ron? Uh, I'm Ron Bronson. I currently work for uh, the federal government's digital agency, 18F. Um, I used to work for the city of Bloomington before that. Before that, I did a lot of other things, sort of all over the place, state, universities, working sort of at the intersection of, of UX and, and content strategy and digital and whatever else. I've been working on the web for a long time, too. Um, yeah, I still live in Bloomington. You can Google me. So. Um, <laughs> Today, we're going to talk to you a little bit about our redesign and kind of how this all went down. It's sort of a laborious process, but an exciting one in a sense. Like Charles said, the cool thing about the city of Bloomington's uh, a web team is that, I mean, for a city of our size, it punches really above its weight in terms of contributing to open source, in terms of being able to develop really cool applications. I mean, there's just a million things the city's done. Um, like I said, again, again, compared to its size. And, and relaunching this website was one of those gargantuan things. And so um, what we're going to talk to you today, if you did, like I said, we'll have one slide where if nothing else, if you're like, ah, you know what, that Bronson guy, a little too much, or whatever else, nothing else, you'll find out what we did and you can leave, but don't. Um, we went from an in-house CMS to Drupal 8. Um, and you're like, we didn't go to 7. We'll explain why in a second. Um, we got rid of, initially, when we launched the site, we went from several thousand pages of content to 500. I know, I know what you're thinking. Who let you do that and why do you all have still jobs? Maybe that's why Ron left. No, that's not why. Um, we'll get into why we did that and how we were able to do that um, throughout this process. And we also, the also thing we do, which is really wild and people are always horrified about, is that we went from a site that allowed people to edit content by department. So if you're in transportation, you edit transportation pages. If you're in uh, the mayor's office, you can edit everything. If you're in, you actually you couldn't, but you know, you could only edit those pages that were assigned to your department. On the new launch, everyone in the city who has access to the website can edit any page on the website except for the front page. And yet no one's abused that power and been fired for doing so yet. 
I know, again, you're horrified by this, but we'll tell you why we did it and why that worked for us. And the last thing, of course, is talking a little bit about some of the content strategy behind what we did in changing our thinking about how we structured the site from a site that was more organizational and focused on our org chart and went towards a, a structure that was more contextual and focused more on the way people actually search websites and how that benefited us. And so with that, Charles is going to start you off. Yes, so a screenshot of our older site. Um, again, we apparently didn't quite get the message that the number one no-no when you think about um, launching a website is, I, I've got an idea, I'll make my own content management system. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Everybody here, I'm sure, can uh, agree with that. And um, so, but we did, and that's what we, we ran with um, uh, on our site um, for about 10 years. So, um, yeah, we, we, we had our, our in-house CMS, um, and as Ron said, uh, with that, our, our previous iteration, what we did was every department had their own content, and that was um, our, our way of enforcing that only people with the right permissions would be able to edit that content. But in practice, um, at least at our, our city uh, uh, organization, content doesn't really fit in a specific department all the time. So there's often a lot of crossover from one department to another where um, somebody in planning and transportation will need to edit a page that's shared with our public works department. And, and that's just the way content is, I think, in, in most organizations. So that type of um, structure of enforcing ownership across or within a department is very brittle. And it ends up causing uh, a lot of requests to, hey, I need, I need permission to edit this page. And then somebody else needs permission to edit that page. And it's a, it's a back and forth thing. So. Um, uh, I don't recommend it after, after our experience. Another thing, as you saw in that, that previous uh, slide, our old site was not responsive. We actually um, had developed a separate mobile um, version of our website that, that only showed on mobile devices. And um, as you can see in the fine print there, in our Google Analytics, the third most popular page on our site was, I really want to view the full site. So um, that, that, mobile, that separate mobile page was, was not a good approach for us. And um, so our goal with the new site was something a little bit more responsive, maintain it in one CMS, and make sure that it works across all devices. So I'll turn it over to Ron here. Cool. So I showed up to Save Bloomington, God, almost, almost two years ago. And when I got the site, the, re the redesign had been already, was already ongoing. And so we inherited, we had a Drupal 7 redes website um, with a totally different design that if you go to the site, that looks different than you see now. Um, and in December of, la of two years ago, we decided after going through some whole process, and so Charles can, will laugh about this, but when I got hired and we were, I was selling them on me and I'm like, yeah, I've done a ton of redesigns. Redesigns are my thing. I love redesigns, which is totally true and also seriously have issues. But, um, but at any rate, I'm like, well, six months, we'll knock this out. It'll be great. We'll totally launch it. Four months into that six months, uh, I'm like, you know, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what happened. He's like, um... Maybe we should think about something different. So, um, so after doing some research and internally and talking to folks and sort of sitting down and saying, we should reboot everything, one of the things we decided was to upgrade to Drupal 8. And the main reason for us doing that, among other things, was that for our political culture and will and just internally, it made sense for us. It was going to be smart for us to say, should we upgrade this now or later? For us doing it then, when the old site was still up and working, and here's another thing, too, is for our internal users, because they had used that old site for so long, there wasn't really the, they knew the no site was coming, we had talked to them about it, they had heard about it, but there wasn't this clamoring for, like, when's the new thing coming? So that gave us a little bit of insulation for, 
it, it was a little bit of a the boy who cries wolf. It, it, yeah. Oh yes, the, uh, the the new site is coming. Right. The new site is coming. Yes, <laughs> yes. And Constantly, lots of that. Every six <laughs> months, and then like they told, and people would say to me, and I'm still new. They're like, "Yeah, y'all said that six months ago," and I'm right. like, "Look, well, I wasn't here then." But <laughs> they didn't care about that. So we decided to upgrade to Drupal eight um, around Christmas time. So clearly, we had a really good Christmas. But um, but it was actually a really good decision. Um, and in that process, we learned a lot of things, like read the manual. Yeah, I, um, I'm embarrassed by how long it took me to actually read the Drupal manual. And the documentation is great. Yeah. You should read it. It, it's, it helps you a lot. <laughs> exactly. Um, the other thing we did was is we had gone through several iterations of our information architecture. And a lot of that was focused on departmental content. And going to departments and saying, what do you, what's the most important thing? What's the answer? All of it. Yes, only five folks looked at that page in the last year, but it's still really important to somebody. Yes. Um, and so that made us think about, okay, so how do folks actually browse our site? How do we actually organize content? How do we deal with those shared pages? Because it turns out there's a lot of shared content. And in our mm -hmm. case, situations where like the city council has pages, but the clerk's office manages those pages. They were in different apartments on our old site. So whenever you wanted to shift the page, you had to go in and change the department, give them temporary permission, and then change it back. Totally not a problem. <laughs> um, and, and ultimately, we checked our misconceptions about how folks browsed our site. Um, you know, we had some ideas about how we thought people looked at our site, how they view things. We, talked to some, we did some small user testing. We didn't have a lot of time or money to really do extensive user testing, but we were able to work with some students at the university to do a little bit of it, and it helped us to sort of recalibrate how we decided to uh, go forward. But really the biggest thing with 8 with us was giving us the chance to really dive into Drupal in a more earnest way and to figure out how it could help us do what we wanted to do faster. Mm -hmm. talk about this. So um, the other thing too is some of the challenges we had. So obviously I don't know where all of you work and I'd love to hear more about that, but one of the things that working in a political organization is you run into, especially at a local government level, is you deal with all, even if you're not directly, okay, the mayor's office doesn't come down and find out what we're doing on a regular basis. I mean, IT in general, but not the website. But one of the challenges of being in an organization is the mayor's change. So it just happened, of course, Charles was there longer than me, so they showed up and the new mayor came in. So that's not good or bad as much as it changes how you focus on your priorities. So if that person comes in and says, I wanna focus on this, this, and this, that website project might get pushed behind because you know, to them, that's not necessarily the first thing they want to focus on. And so as an IT team, you're trying to figure out constantly with developers, trying to figure out how you allocate those resources and everything else. Obviously, a small team of four, um, really three and a half, right. focusing on not just supporting the website, but also something like 30 different applications internally. A lot of those in-house that were built in-house that we're managing for all these different uh, tools like the animal shelter and, and parks and recreation and all these other so uh, systems that are being supported in-house. Um, the web team is also part of the larger uh, IT team and supporting some of their applications as well. So there's a lot of priority shifting that happens. So really you get me coming in and this is sort of my only job was working on the website and dealing with customers, but then our other developers are having other things to do and that was challenging. And also limited resources. You can't just go buy something when you want it. I mean, we were, I, I think, having been a lot of places, I tell Charles, I, I appreciated how we were able to do what we were able to do, but you also just didn't have a limitless budget to just, you know, hire a new person or do whatever. And so that allowed, that sort of, the, the constraints there were, 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 were difficult and we worked through them, but those were some of the barriers that we had to work with. And so. Yeah, so um, again, going back to what Ron hinted at, where um, we, we started by engaging with our departments and saying, well, what, what content do you want to migrate to the new site? And when, as, as Ron said, everybody said everything. Yes, we want it all. And um, so we, I had initially spent some time creating these spreadsheets of uh, all the content, kind of keeping it grouped by that departmental structure. And um, quickly found that 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 just didn't work for us. Um, we, one, we, we couldn't really identify what those core content pieces were. And two, we started to realize that um, organizing our content around the organization's departmental structure, the organization's org chart, is not how our end users were really engaging with that content. They, they wanted to find a service to help them in their life. They didn't want to know 
how the city was organized. They didn't want to know what department was responsible for that content. So um, we, we, stayed, we stayed engaged with um, our, our content creators in, in the departments. Um, but ultimately, what we decided was the most effective was to use data. And um, Google Analytics is a wonderful thing. So um, we, we, uh, we, we started running out of time, and we just needed to migrate the content. And what better content to migrate than the stuff that everybody's looking for, the stuff that everybody is actually using. And um, that gave us a very clear, easy to follow list of what content to migrate. You start at the top, you work your way down, and um, you very quickly find the other pages that need to come to complete that content. But um, it, it, gives us, it gave us a really clear, easy to follow path for that content migration. So um, yeah. And, as, as we did this, we, um, we, we got a chance to see all of the pages that had um, kind of gotten lost in the old system. So um, we would often find duplicates for the same type of content that multiple people had created, but didn't really know that somebody else had created a page for that already. Or, or going back to that departmental structure for permissions, maybe somebody in one department created a page that was very similar to a page in another department, but because of that artificial barrier, um, they weren't able to really collaborate on that content. So what we found in, in our audit was that um, a, a lot of those pages were just abandoned or not kept up to date. And, and that really led us to these, these two ideas of anybody can edit content on our new site. We, we love the uh, revision history in Drupal. <laughs> that is key. So um, that way, not only do we know who made a change, but we can facilitate people working together on that content. And, and, and there is some... Uh, uh, security there, or peace of mind, knowing that if anybody makes uh, a mistake in editing the content, there's a way to get back. Um, at least in our organization, we've found that the real challenge is getting people to make those updates and keep content up to date. So any, anything that we can do to remove those barriers is actually a good thing. Um, and, and then the second thing that we did was we do not allow anybody to create a new page. That, that is something that we control in ITS, and that has already um, saved us, I think, a lot of <laughs> extra content. Um, we, we get requests. Uh, initially, we had set up a Google form, but now we just ask people to send an email to the webmaster asking for these new pages. And what we find is that um, I would say um, nine times out of ten almost. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's quite frequent that just searching our, our site's content, I find the page that they're looking for, and it already exists. And they just needed to know where it was and, right. and, um, and know that they have the ability to make changes on that page and, and feel empowered to do that. So um, yeah, I'll turn it back over to Ron here. So the decision to migrate the top 500 pages wasn't just a brilliant masterstroke. I mean, it was, but that's not why we decided to do it. It was mostly a time thing. So like I said about political will, we went from kind of like, ah, it's going to be a site. Ah, the site's coming. Ah, the site's coming to, hey, the site needs to be launched in April. <laughs> it was January. And we decided to migrate to Drupal 8. And we didn't know it super well. OK, great. And then in April, they're like, OK, you have two weeks. And then in May, they're like, OK, we have three weeks. <laughs> And then the end of May, they said, next week. <laughs> and the beginning of June, they said, June 10th, and there's a press conference. <laughs> it, it did launch in June. <laughs> <laughs> it, it finally launched in June. <laughs> but the point is, is, because of that constant change, it forced us to be, A, make sure that when we did launch, it wasn't a site of just like nothing, but also figuring out, again, when people go to the site, 
what's the most, what are the most important things? The other thing that we did, and I don't know, I think it's a slide for it later, but I do want to mention it since it's here. It's a separate system that's for our board and commission agendas that are not housed within our CMS that just has, and the beauty of that was that it allows some folks who are not even city employees at all to be able to upload content um, and update, update content. Um, and there's a whole process there. But the beauty of that was it did enable us to be tied to that content inside of the website as well. And, and real quick, I, I realized that we didn't have a slide for this, but that, that's another thing that I would caution um, really any organization is um, don't get bogged down in the integrations with other systems. Oh, yeah. um, so that's something that uh, I would actually say that's one of the big reasons why we didn't get our Drupal 7 instance up and running is that we spent a lot of time oh, yeah. um, working on these custom in integrations, custom Drupal mod modules with our other systems. And it's very easy to lose sight of the core content, the core content that you need to migrate um, and, and get lost in how do I, how do I integrate this, this third party system or this external system. And um, those things are good to do. Those integrations are good to do and we've, we've been able to tackle them since. But um, if you're just starting an initial site migration or content migration, uh, a new site, really focusing on that, that new content. So how we got from the old site to the new site, um, and one of the things just briefly, really, really briefly, about some of the design changes we made, the most specific thing we were trying to do, and Drupal was great about letting us do this, was that we, didn't, we felt like on the old site there wasn't a very good sense of place. And in, in, in some of our previous iterations of the website, we didn't really do a great job of like promoting photos and like trying to, and not having a ton of photos. We didn't want photos everywhere, partially because of just the way end users tend to like want to put things in random places they don't belong. And so we just, we sort of, after a lot of iteration and some design changes, we decided to, and if you go to the site now, you can see it on different pages. It's sort of having a big giant picture that users can edit those. And each page is different. Every page has one. Um, and it ended up being a really good compromise um, internally for us, but you know, it, and so I guess what you're hearing constantly is, is we tried to balance user needs internally, stakeholders internally, with what the public was telling us they wanted. Because what we also did mention is throughout this entire process, from the from the pre-alpha days to the minute we launched and even after, we had a forum on our website. It was at the top that let folks give feedback, anybody, and folks gave us feedback. Oh boy, did they! But it was really helpful most of the time to get that feedback because even the feedback that wasn't super helpful was helpful because it allowed us, if you see enough people saying the same things over and over again, you realize even if you don't wanna hear it, you're like, okay, we need to think about that or we need to address that or maybe we're not looking at things the right way. Um, and so, but balancing all of those, those considerations was, was part of what we were trying to do the entire time. And so, like I mentioned earlier, go ahead. Well, and uh, just jumping in real quick, Please. That was what ultimately led to, um, I would say, our, our final yeah. uh, site architecture. Definitely. So um, we, we experimented with a lot of different information architectures, and um, what, what we ultimately got was, um, based on feedback, there were, I would say, four different groups mm -hmm. of, of people oh, yeah. that uh, wanted to use the site. So there were, there, there were people who just wanted to publish the latest news, uh, the, the latest events that were happening in the city. And, and that, that became one of our, our core um, main uh, subcategories. Sub there, were, there were people that just wanted to talk about the operations of the organization. So kind of getting back to that departmental structure um, that, that was the operations, um, the boards and commissions, uh, the, the inner workings of our city. And then finally, um, the, the other two are kind of information and guides and then highlighting our top services. So trying to be very um, public uh, focused on what, what do our constituents need? What are they looking for? How, how are they interacting with our city? So. That, that turned out to be a very uh, stable way to structure our content and, and meet a lot of those needs. 
Because what you find in local government and probably in other organizations as well is that people aren't finding what they're looking for, especially in a situation where it's like, okay, like if it's a business, they'll just go somewhere else. But with a city, there's, no, there's nowhere else to go. So if they can't find it, they're gonna show up or they're gonna call you. And they're gonna do that constantly. And so you find out when folks are calling constantly because they can't find something. And we get you know, secondary feedback on this stuff. You realize, okay, well, it's a problem. Well, the calls are different now than they were, say, a year ago. And so that's a win. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I'll add to the slide, I've talked about it already, is that even though we didn't really necessarily leverage the plugin repository super well, we, we don't have a ton of plugins. I mean, I've been gone. I don't know what you've done since I left. But, but we, we, I'm just, you know, I mean, just, you know, woo, plugins. But, um, <laughs> but, what, but it, what was nice about it was that it enabled us, even we only installed a few paragraphs, um, some others. But what was helpful for us was just having the ability to cut down on the in-house development time to do things that we would want to do a heck of a lot faster, especially given our shifting timelines, than would have been the case had we been doing something different. Um, and having one place to go to get those, those, those uh, plugins, as opposed to you know, some sort of free-for-all of plugin mania that other CMSs may come with. And so sort of overall lessons learned, um, I mean, there are a ton of them, but I think that really assessing what the most important things are, figuring out who your audience is, whether this is, again, whether you're in a city, whether you're working for you know, a business or whatever else, understanding who your stakeholders are and not just external stakeholders, but also internal folks as well. Because if your subject matter experts aren't updating content, if they're not engaged, and one of the things we kept preaching, and this happened before I got there and happened while I was there, it's still happening now, I'm sure, is communicating to stakeholders that if you don't own this content, people aren't going to get the information. Like this actually is your job. And, 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 over, and, over, and part of how we were able to do that was, and this was a team effort, it wasn't just one person, was hammering home the points constantly to people in-house through, we'd have in-person sessions. We sent out emails constantly. So we were the boy cry wolf, but we sent a lot of emails updating folks on what was happening, even if they didn't seem to care. And they did, once we told them more and more and they saw progress happening, that was encouraging to them. Um, by having, we used to, we made screenshots. We did, we made, I made screencasts for people. So there were no, there was really nobody could say, oh, well, I don't know how to do this because there were eight different ways to do it. And then we'd sit with them upstairs in our IT room at least once a month. When we launched, it was once a week and say, all right, what are your problems? Literally anything you need. How can we help you? And then if they had a very specific problem, this is one person who's always wants a problem or something like that, we schedule time with them to sit down and help them figure out their problem. So it's very hands-on and very labor-intensive in a way, but it needed to be that way for us to be able to get the buy-in necessary. The other thing, too, is the buy-in from above. We had a lot of top cover that enabled us to do things like cut 90% of the content on the site and keep our jobs. Um, I recognize that for most people, that's not a thing you can do, or it may not even be tenable to do it, but still thinking about what are the most important things? Um, like Charles said, don't tackle everything at once. You can't tackle integrations and also migrate and also upgrade and also redevelop and also like mm -hmm. prioritize what's important, figure out what your main goals are, sell that case to whoever you have to sell it to in order to make those things be the things you wanna focus on and then go in steps. And if you can do that, it's gonna make your life easier. Um, also recognizing your constraints. I mean, whether it's institutional constraints, inter internal constraints, departmental constraints, um, and vocalize those things. Often I feel like in situations we like to be the hero, so we don't want to talk about what the problems are or what our constraints are. But if someone doesn't understand what those constraints are, they can't, even in, turn, even in your stakeholders, we tell them, hey, look, there are four of us. Here's what we're working on. So they understood what we were up against in trying to serve them so that they're, you know, when you didn't respond to their email the next day or something, and we were really good about that. But in cases where we didn't do those things, folks understand that, oh, you've got a big job. Yeah, we do. Um, and, and the last thing is just, is just sparing the details. It, I, I feel like in tech a lot, we like to over explain things to, to users and people don't necessarily care about the minutia and the details because we're really excited about it. And sometimes like, I don't know that we used to wear Drupal a whole lot in our conversations. I mean, we told them we were changing to a new platform. We discussed that it was Drupal, but we didn't get into the architecture of it. We didn't explain about how great it was. We, we tell them what was useful about it, but we kept it to a minimum because at the end of the day, they don't really care about that. They want to know how it works for them, what it's going to do for them. And when they saw how it worked, they're like, oh my gosh, this is so much easier. Remember we had, I remember the first time we did a session, like an actual user session, on a screen like this in a room somewhere. And everyone's very skeptical because we talked about this a lot. And then we showed them how easy it was going to be to update pages. And they're like, and so someone said, oh my goodness, this is going to save me so much time. And we were just like, 
ha, we did it, we're, we're here. <laughs> so sometimes it's just show rather than tell. Yep. Um, so I, I think this, this goes back to what, what Ron was getting at, where um, we, we engaged with our, our internal users a lot as far as what questions they had and what challenges they were facing. And one thing that helped us was developing internal documentation in internal yeah. training materials early, getting those started right out of the gate. Because then as we had these, um, these questions come up, we could just fill in where, where the gaps were. And, and that resource has, has really helped us with um, onboarding new employees at the city. Um, we, we still get questions of, well, I, I would like my new employee to have access to edit content on the website. And it's like, well, they already have it. You know, they, they can do it right now. And I, I have an easy way to share some initial documentation with them, and um, they can run through that at their, at their own pace. And, and then we're still there for any other questions and can fill in that documentation as we go. So that, that has been great, and I encourage any organization to um, be sure that you're um, actively updating that, that material. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think we've covered. Oh, one other thing I thought about, too, is guidelines. So there weren't a whole lot of, we didn't have a ton of codified guidelines about like everything in terms of what's allowed on the site, what's not allowed on the site, what permit, you know, what you can do, what you can't do. Um, at least it was sort of, sort of like articulated, but it wasn't documented. And we sort of decided throughout this process that it would be really important to document those things so that when someone asks for something, you can just point back to the guidelines and say, you know, actually it's not in the web guidelines or, you know, um, trying to work on tone and voice as well, um, trying to figure out some of the other content things. But it's, if you can document anything, it's going to make your job easier later, um, irrespective of how you're using the CMS or what you're doing with it. Um, because you can be consistent about how you apply uh, whatever it is you're trying to do and everything else we've kind of covered. Um, like I said, it's really, really helpful. It's been really, really helpful to be part of a wider community um, because it enables us to, to, to share stories and, and, and have conversations about like what works, best practices, um, rather than especially coming from an in-house, especially coming from an in-house system where it's just like, it's us, good luck. Um, having a system that, that other people are using and deploying in lots of different ways. Um, well, and, and, and the other thing that really helped us was looking at other cities who, oh, yeah. had, who had used Drupal. Um, we, Boston. Boston had <laughs> just recently done a, a migration the year before. Um, we saw them at Code for America, and it was just great to have um, an example to look at, see what they had done, see what had worked for them, see what things, um, uh, like they were able to rewrite every piece of content before it went on the site. We would have loved to have done that, but it wasn't realistic for us to tackle that. But just l hearing those stories, and, and, um, and the other great thing about um, being in a, a municipal government and being able to make all of that open source is that um, anybody can use that work. It's, it's available. Please use it. You know? like, like, and, and that's a great place to be where we can share that, um, both design, content, strategies, anything. So post-launch, um, site traffic's up. Um, for the first time, folks are no longer having the click that want to see full site <laughs> uh, because mobile traffic is the majority of the traffic. When I, I mean, it was somewhere over 50, 50, over 50 percent um, months ago, um, which is great. Um, internal search, this is actually the things we didn't expect were things like internal search dropped like 70%. And what I mean is people were using internal search a ton on the old site to try to find what they were looking for and not finding it. On the new site, they barely search, but they get where they want to go. And, it's, and you can tell because they're just like, literally it's just one click, two clicks, they get where they're going. As before, they were like four or five levels deep because that's how the site was set up. We didn't really want the new site to go more than three layers deep. It does sometimes, but we try to minimize that. Um, 
I think the exit rate dropped quite a bit. Um, bounce rates dropped dramatically. I mean, like some absurd number that doesn't even sound like a real number. And the site gets a decent amount of traffic, so it's not even like it's a site with 20 people on it. And you're like, oh, well, does that really mean anything? The numbers that were changing were big. Of course, to be fair, you could take the entire city website down, only put the animal shelter up, and we probably see amount of traffic, to be fair. But, <laughs> like, it's by far, it eclipses anything else on the site by far. It's like there's the animal shelter and everything else. Even the homepage. And, even, and, and that was another lesson that we learned. Uh, a lot of people in our, in our city, they want their content on the homepage, but it, it doesn't really matter. Um, that's, that's not what's driving people to their specific content. It needs to be well written. Um, Google is, is going to drive people to that content. And I think our animal shelter is, is proof of that. It oh, gets yeah. more traffic than our homepage itself. So. And it's not off the front page, so you can't go straight to the animal <laughs> shelter. You've got to get it. Right. Yeah, should so be on the front page. Should but. be. <laughs> should be just dogs on the front page and nothing else. Just cats and rabbits. We have a big rabbit town. I don't really get it. So um, some resources that you can check out. Yeah. Um, we, like I said, we do have a, a, all of our Drupal modules are on our, our GitHub page. Um, we're happy to talk about what we've done and share, share anything that we've done. Um, we, have, we have a number of those other third party or uh, separate systems from Drupal that we've created. We have a custom uh, boards and committee membership tracking system that uh, we use to track our meeting uh, minutes and agendas um, and, and packets. And We've integrated that with our Drupal instance. We've had uh, success integrating uh, Google Calendar with Drupal so that um, uh, our calendar and events listings are driven by the Google calendars that um, city staff are actually using to track their meeting, um, meeting events. Um, like Ron mentioned, we, have, we use an open source software for um, our animal shelter animal shelter manager, and we, we wrote a Drupal module to pull the animals that are up for adoption and be able to show those in real time on our Drupal site. So um, a, a lot of good resources there, and we'd be happy to um, collaborate with anybody on that. So yeah. That's it. Ask lots of questions. Or anyway, thanks for your time. Thank you all. Yes. So the question is, do we have any workflow or review uh, uh, now that we have a new workflow for reviewing content before it goes live? And uh, the answer is no. Um, we, we have um, people who work for the city, and um, we have the public. And if anything goes up that shouldn't go up, um, we have that revision history, and we can go back and have that conversation. But. Um, like I said, we, we've had more of a challenge getting people to make those edits than we have um, so far, um, knock on wood, we haven't had anything go up that shouldn't have been up. So um, that hasn't proved to be an actual um, issue. That was true on the old site too. You could just edit. As long as in your department, you could edit the content the same way. So that might help. The status quo is kind of it's kind of the same now. You just edit anything, but people don't want to do extra work. Yep. By opening up anybody to edit anything, did you notice your the amount of people who were like trained and had access to edit go down? Up. Up. Uh, yeah. By so far. The the question just for the recording is uh, by opening up access, did we notice the number of people who were making edits go up or down? Um, yeah, I would, I would definitely say that the number has gone up. Um, and that was even pre-launch. So like pre-launch, we trained some folks who are more active, went to departments and said, hey, you can get a jump on this, put some content in the site, and they took us up on it and started adding content months before we launched the site, which was really helpful for us, of course, because you know, we were at capacity. Um, but yeah, by far, compared to the old site. On the old site, there may have been a dozen people at any given time during the year who were regular, regular users of the site. 
um, that number is surely tripled by now. I, the other the other thing I would add to that is I, I think migrating to a system like Drupal that is more user friendly than our uh, our previous system. Um, what we saw on our old site was that most departments would delegate updating oh, yeah. content to their interns. And so the interns would be kind of the primary voice of our city. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then they would leave. Like yeah. an intern is not gonna stick around very long. So um, kind of lowering that barrier to entry, having something that's a little bit uh, more user friendly, um, we're, we're seeing better engagement and more, more people are making those edits. Thank you. Any other? Um, so do you, so you do a help desk, sort of immediate help desk project for the people that you're working with. Um, what did you do in your team to create a culture that was not sort of very mansplaining when um, you're teaching new people to work next door? Um, so how did we, um, the, create an open, engaging environment to supporting our customers without mansplaining um, <laughs> about, their, uh, about the content or the process. Um, yeah. I, I think that honestly, I think it starts from the top in that department. It's just in general, this, just the way the structure department is, is very customer focused and customer, customer centric. And, and so I think that that probably helped a lot so the rapport was already there. So this wasn't an onboarding process. Hey, we're new. We're talking to you. It was more these are ongoing customers. It's not a very big city, so you know we're not we're dealing with tens of people rather than thousands or hundreds of people, which probably helps some too. Um, yeah, I, I would add that just being uh, focused on customer service, yeah. and in in our case, it, our customers are internal employees, other staff in the city, and and trying to. Um, Help them, help us, and, and, and be on the same team and, and listen to what their, what their questions are. Yeah, like not being condescending or, or rude or, I mean, I think, I think being a local government probably lends itself to a different than other organizations where you'd have more of an education process or a, of trying to educate people on these kinds of things. But I think that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing process, right, of creating a culture and a climate that is supportive of of everyone and meet people where they're at. I think that's it, right? Like yeah. not assuming yeah. people should know something. Folks come to us often, you know, everyone working in tech has heard someone say, oh, I don't know this really well, or I'm dumb. And it's like, no, you're not. You, you're competent, you know what you're doing. Let's just figure this out or let's make this more accessible. And, and, and Ron also hinted, like we, we didn't go into a lot of um, Drupal specific oh, yeah. jargon. We, we, we tried to keep it very high level and um, just, Non, non technical. Yeah, no one knows what a node is in our organization, and, and, and it's still the site still works. Like, it's great. Um, you had a question in the back? The young, yes. So the question. So the question was, is, is talk more about our, some of the user experience research that went into uh, the process and whatever else. And so, well, again, we, didn't, we, we did several things. Obviously, using analytics was very helpful for us in terms of just being able to figure out, like, to sort of map a flow of where people are going. Um, we did some in-person stuff as well, talking. We had some students work, working with some students uh, at the university to talk to some um, end, user, end users, just stakeholders that we had no idea who they were, to find out how they use the site. Um, and that, that was more at the design stage, where yeah. we, we had mock-ups, and um, we, we engaged with our local university, yeah. had, had a great intern helping us with oh, God, some of those design great. elements, and then um, taking those out to, to people. And then the other thing was the, the, the Google Form oh, the survey, yeah. that, that we had up on our, our alpha site, so we, we were able to put, put the website up before it was ready and, and solicit public feedback. Um, and, and we would do press releases uh, encouraging the public to come to that alpha site, take a look, use, use just a simple Google form to give us that feedback of, of anything that they thought. That was probably the biggest thing in terms of actual user research that we did was getting that feedback. And, in that, and that, that form was up the entire time. So every iteration of the alpha, you saw that. 
um, form on the site. So people, folks who are developers often would write back and be like, this is the worst site I've ever seen in my life. I built better sites than this in my sleep. <laughs> And we, we never did want to write back and say, you can come help us, but we never did that, but we wanted to. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so that, that was probably the biggest thing that we did. A lot of other anecdotal smaller things that we would do just to get some snapshots, but probably more on the design research side than we did on the, other than the survey on the UX side of it, just because of capacity. Yes. Sure. Perfect. So I'm very curious as to how, um, and we're also rebuilding our board and agenda posting stuff, which they are also trying to use Drupal on and scaring the crap out of the guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you could talk more about that, I would appreciate it. Sure. Um, so is, is part of that wanting to expand Drupal, the use of Drupal outside of your specific department, or? Okay. Sure. So that was that was an area that we had concern using Drupal for because we didn't want it to um, bog down the system with a lot of uh, manually updated um, information. And and board and committee members are changing all of the time. Um, our city staff liaison for those boards and commissions are changing as as employees come and go. Um, and we were more comfortable developing a, a separate system. We, we call it Onboard, and um, that's, that's a, a, a PHP application that we wrote that's, that's open source and available on our GitHub, and we do have a, a Drupal module um, that integrates with that system. So um, we decided to opt for a, a kind of a separate system that would handle managing those documents um, uh, and, and uh, tying those together with the corresponding um, uh, meeting dates. So that, that was ultimately what, what we decided to do was kind of keep that, that separate system. Thank you. I'm back. Yes. I had put all that stuff together to make sure the different sections were out, make sure they could only enter their content and everything. Uh, so I'm kind of curious, because that was all built in Drupal 7. Okay. Um, I'm kind of curious to how you guys uh, separate out the different content, as in where the animal shelter can just do the animal shelter content, mayor's office can do the mayor's office content. How was that set up? Well, um, so as far as. Uh, are you talking information architecture or, or like more of a lower level system? Uh, the system. So like in, what, I, what I mean by that is like when I built it in Drupal 7 and I used Workbench, uh, I was able to use the sections in there and just make sure everyone kept their own content. So in Drupal uh, 8, I wonder, was it, was you guys use work, work, uh, Workbench uh, moderation or did you guys use Workflow? We, we didn't use anything like that. Um, again, our, our our content is rather open as far as who can edit it, but I, 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 one thing that we didn't touch on that, that was very useful is the, our use of aliases, oh, yeah. uh, URL aliases. So trying to topically group content under, under a, um, a, a subdirectory effectively. I mean, it's, it's not really a, a subdirectory, but um, grouping that similar content yeah. under under those URLs and making sure that everything has a, a good um, named route uh, for that alias. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly. Whoa. So we didn't. Yeah, we didn't separate the content. Actually, so some of the some of the applications, like the Animal Shelter, is a separate application entirely, and the content gets pulled into Drupal. Um, and Charles can speak to that. Um, and so other, we have other things like that. Board and commissions, the same thing. It's a separate application. The application, the content gets pulled into our Drupal instance. Um, but the actual content for Drupal is just like actual city hall content, and it's, so it's just the content people can edit. But those aren't separate by con separate by department. So we didn't separate it by department. So folks can only focus access their content. They can access anything, um, which is unusual. But in our in our case, it made sense because we have so many things that are shared that if we didn't do that, what would happen is you'd have 
redundant content for different departments on the site because folks would be like, well, I have to have my version of this page on the site. So we chose, chose not to do that, um, to separate by, to silo it out so folks can't edit things. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. Sure. Or, you know, because it's actually really like a mid sized city. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, like I'm from like the sticks. Right. Like rural New Hampshire. So, you know, how would that be different from that? So, so the question is how is working on a site for a city the size of Bloomington different than working for either a bigger city like Boston or even a smaller city? And I, I think the answer to that is that. Um, most cities have uh, similar services that they have to offer regardless of what size they are. Mm -hmm. I, I think the only difference comes in the amount of resources that they have, the amount of people that they have dedicated to doing a specific task. So the smaller the city, I think, generally, the, the fewer um, people that you have working on that specific task or the more hats that people have to wear. So the, the more that you can leverage something that's um, kind of already been done and solved, I think the better, the better you are. Also, just interference. So somebody who went from like really small places to state government to local and now doing federal work, what's interesting is the, the amount of people who are inter running in the in interference in terms of what you're trying to do. And so Bloomington was sort of like, almost just the right size. I mean, there's obviously some interference because you just have levels of whatever, but it's not so much that, like, you can get to anybody you need to talk to is right, you can go talk to them. You don't need to get, make an appointment to go talk to somebody for the most part. You can just go, hey, have a five-minute conversation and solve problems. Um, in a smaller place, I think you'd have more of that. In a bigger place, you'd have a lot less of that just because of the constraints involved. Um, but I think that it's the right size in terms of resources and access but not, you know, not so little that you can't get anything done or you're just like, we can't do anything, but not so big that um, it gets to be unwieldy or you have a lot of, a lot of sort of hands in the pot. Yeah. Yes and then yes. One and then two, yeah. So the, when we, oh, so the question was, is 90% of the content we dropped, if you're still maintaining it in-house, how do you do that? The old site is still accessible internally only, and we did that because obviously when in folks, folks, if they're gonna migrate it later, and I mean, it's been almost a year now, at the time, we're like, well, if you wanna migrate it later, and you will, in most cases, you wanna be able to access that content and then be able to pull it over to the new site or clean it up. And so we allowed people to do that, and so they still can access it um, from in internally. Um, yeah, and that, that goes along with, um, during the actual site right. migration, one, one of the issues that we were having, uh, and, and it, it could be because we had cried wolf so many times and, and, and said that, oh yes, the site is launching, but yeah. one of the issues that we were having was getting people to actually, actually do, do help us with that content migration. Mm -hmm. And um, this was a way that we could launch with kind of that core content, but still maintain the old system internally um, so that if there was something that we missed that, that truly needed to be on the new site, um, employees would still have access to it. Um, but we wanted to make sure that that's internal only because we don't want to confuse the public or still have those old links out there and, and have people stumbling across that old content. Also, we created redirects for every one of the old pages. <laughs> it's redirects for every one of the old pages on the on the on Google, so you didn't, you know. So, yeah. so yeah, that was that was a that was a yeoman's effort for sure. We had one question. The last. Yes. Um, so, looking on the content dropping to the ninety, uh, the content dropping ninety percent of the content. Um, I'm wondering if you have any ideas about like how you of course. Everybody. Yes. Yes. So the question is, is you know, okay, working at a university and trying to build buy-in, how do you get buy-in to be able to cut content um, from the site? So having been in the university bucket, I can tell you that, um, well, for us, just to answer the question and then I'll speak more specifically, um, 
I think that for us it was several things. One, it was what ended up being time based. I feel like. I mean, you speak to it. Uh, the the I, I would say that the biggest thing that um, got us buy in was the frustration that everybody had in using the old site, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. both internally and and feedback that we would get from the public, mm -hmm. saying that they just had a hard time using the site and the main reason that they had a hard time using the site was because there was too much content, too much stale content, um, out, outdated content. So of course it's going to be difficult to, um, uh, to find what you're looking for if, if the content is a mess. And the only way you can really solve that is by doing some serious house, housekeeping. Um, so that gave us buy-in, like uh, our, our, our mayor and um, directors oh, yeah. knew, knew that this was an issue. They had, they had received these complaints from the public before, so they, they knew it was a problem. And the numbers, I guess, yeah, you reminded me. The last, the other thing is the numbers. Using the analytics was a very powerful way, to, even to departments, to say, look, eight people have been to this page in two years. I know, because I ran the numbers. <laughs> and then they'd look at you and go, oh. <laughs> okay, I, I, I guess I can tie that with some other page. Yeah, maybe right. we can. And so I think that that's a really powerful way to just show people that and it's not always that it's not important and it's not being dismissive, right? It's just like, how can we consolidate this or how can we make this in a way that people are going to find it? Do we need to move it up? Do we need to change it? There are some situations occasionally where folks had content that maybe only had 25 views over a year, but for whatever reason, it was either in the wrong place or it was really important content, but you know, we didn't know why. Maybe it had forms on it or something like that, so we needed to dredge it up. So those are situations exist, but 80% of the time, they're just pages that people forgot about or need to be ignored. So I think having the data at your, at your disposal is really helpful, and also talking about figuring out what people are looking for is a really good way to, to do that. Um, I think we're at time, so if you have any questions, we'll be around. Feel free to ping us. We appreciate you very much. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you.